Hello, everybody. My name is Jacqueline Winston. Um, I'm the chair of undergraduate theology. And we have the privilege today of having a theology conference this morning, this evening, and then tomorrow evening are the three keynote sec uh, sessions. And we're doing this a little bit different in the sense that it's not going to be these big long speeches uh, with brilliant men who are, these are all brilliant men, waxing eloquently, but rather we are being given the privilege uh, to watch a, uh, three men whose careers have spanned many years and they have looked at many issues with regard to the faith. We have the privilege of having John Caputo, who is a professor emeritus from Syracuse University, well known in philosophy, and um, he will be uh, sharing on that panel, as well as um, Stanley Hauerwas, who is now professor emeritus as well from Duke, and uh, quite extensive, and they've had a wonderful uh, ongoing relationship with Craig over many years, our own professor Craig Keene, who is the professor of systematic theology here at APU and will be retiring this year. Um, for those of you who know Craig really well, um, he always, you know, you have these conversations with him, they're very deep and you find yourself going, okay. And so often what is said is less about what hits your head and more about the way in which you get a divine encounter. And so my hope and prayer this morning is that we will have that kind of a divine encounter. The title th for this conference came from the fact that um, a type of feshrif, a celebration volume is being written, has been written, uh, celebrating the theology of Craig Keene. And it's titled Whistling in the Dark. Now, I know many of you go, what in the world does that mean, whistling in the dark? Well, I had a privilege, I didn't know the phrase, but I grew up on Pogo. And Pogo was a comic strip written by Walt Kelly. And it is Walt Kelly who came up with this phrase. The phrase reads, in this dark, when we all talk at once, some of us must learn to whistle. And I think this is a perfect metaphor for Craig's own theological method. He, he has a type of theopoetics that rejects easy answers and instead insists on a deep reflection that seeks the face of God. Craig's a soft-spoken man who speaks deliberately, but in the gentleness of his voice, the depth of his words manage to penetrate the myriad discourses which vie for our attention and insist on forcing us to settle for simplistic answers in a complex world. I want to ask a favor of you, both now and through all of the sessions you'll be with us. Quite often when people think of theology, it kind of gets into this thing of, we go very propositional and we want to have all of the answers all in one piece and we want to be able to write them in 10 good points. I don't think that's what the purpose of good theology is, and I don't even necessarily think that's the purpose. I know it's not the purpose of this conference. Instead, would you decide that what's going to happen is you're going to have clarification on some things that you never thought of before? But there will be other things that it'll be an opportunity for God to kind of go down in those deep places of you and start stirring them up. And it'll be a journey for a period of time. When I was thinking of this phrase, um, whistling in the dark, I thought of the time of Israel's greatest conflict, and it's in 1 Kings 19.11. And the prophet Elijah was running from the rulers, Jezebel was one, um, whose idolatry and violence threatened to destroy the people of God. He listened for the voice of the Lord only to discover that it was not in the mighty wind, not in the earthquake, or in a fire. Instead, as Elijah huddled, huddled in fear on the side of the mountain, waiting for the reassurance that he had not been abandoned by God, he heard the voice of God in the silence. Would you agree with me that we won't settle for the useless white noise that draws us simply because it is the most persistent? Instead, over the next two days, 
I encourage you to entertain the many aha moments which will be elicited by the interaction of these speakers, but also allow the voice of God to penetrate the silence to speak to you personally, to energize you for the next leg of your journey, to encourage you in the face of disappointment, to befriend you in your loneliness, and to excite you in anticipation of the future successes and discoveries of divine purpose for your life. Uh, I want to invite our dean, the dean of the School of Theology and the AP Seminary to come forward, and he's going to lead us in a welcoming prayer. As many of you know, Craig has taken up saxophone over the last several years, so when they approached me about the stage decorations and I forked out the money to get the hippie jazz club theme behind us, <laughs> the, uh, I had, did not uh, waste any expenses. Actually, for any of you on campus, you know that uh, yesterday we kicked off Godspell, which is a play that will be over the next couple weeks. And Godspell was uh, written in 1971, the same year that uh, one of our featured people this morning was beginning his senior year at Southern Nazarene University in Bethany, Oklahoma. In one of the scenes in Godspell, there's this question and answer time between uh, the disciples and Jesus, at which one point in Godspell, Jesus said, did I promise you an answer to that question? So as I think about this morning and even what uh, Professor Winston just said, uh, we're going to walk away with answers, but we're also going to walk away with other questions on how to deepen our faith. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to just slow down in our busy, busy years and honor a dear friend, welcome distinguished guests, and to have a time where we can just uh, find that sweet music, that whistling, in uh, at times sometimes very difficult days. I thank you for all the planning that went into this. I thank you for just all the, uh, all the, the love and care in this room as we all come to uh, honor Craig, but also just to uh, be his friends as we think about uh, theology, philosophy, and all the things that we are discussing over the next two days. Uh, intervene in all of the sessions. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, the way I've asked uh, them to begin, I'm going to do, I'm serving as moderator, but if you know them at all, I probably will have to do very, almost nothing. So, I've asked them to start off by telling them anything they want to about themselves and then to begin with our first question. And this morning's theme is the lessons of the classical mothers and fathers of the faith. And so I've asked them to start off with this question. What philosophical, theological, and or historical factors influenced the development of the early church's identity? Were there additional events that changed the church's identity, and if so, how? What lessons does the process of identity development for the early church teach us for the church today? So they can go at it any way they want. Um, and you also want us to say something about ourselves first. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm uh, sort of the odd man out up here because my uh, tradition is uh, Catholic. And uh, I am also a philosopher, but by training a philosopher. Uh, and the only excuse I have for being here is that um, Craig and I are friends, and fr Craig and I are, I think, from the first time I came in touch with his work, on the, on the same wavelength. I, 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 I very much resonate with the way he puts things. Um, and uh, the, the other excuse is that I'm a philosopher, I'm, a, I'm sort of a recovering philosopher. <laughs> or an unfaithful philosopher. If I were married to philosophy, I would be cheating on my wife. <laughs> and I've never been able to make up my mind about whether I wanted to do philosophy or theology, so at a certain point in my life, I just decided not to make my mind up and to just keep on keeping on what, doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm Craig Keene, and I'm retiring soon. Uh, I realized yesterday that I'll be giving my last final exam one month from today. By the way, that yay was his wife. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've, uh, I've been here for, th this is the end of my 14th year. Uh, it's the fourth place I've taught. This is the longest I've taught anywhere. Um, in a month or so, we're moving to San Diego. 
where I hope to learn how to be a husband again. Uh, I hope to be able to practice the saxophone as much as our neighbors can stand. I uh, hope to play with, um, with dogs as much as possible. Uh, and I hope also to do some writing and maybe teaching. I don't know. I'm still thinking about that. Um, my, my own theological background, it is, well, let me put it this way. Um, I've, I stumbled my way into theology. I was actually a philosophy major first. Stumbled my way into theology and found that I was captiva captivated by the issues of theology. Um, I never let go of my philosophical interests, uh, but they have been pretty consistently um, secondary to my theological interests. In fact, I don't consider myself um, a philosopher. I mean, I'm a systematic theologian, so you're, that means I'm not anything. I mean, systematic theology is such that you, you sort of dabble in everything, the kind of jack-of-all-trades idea. Um, but um, there are two figures that have been especially important to me, uh, and they very likely will come out in what I have to say today. Um, the first is John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley, an 18th century theologian. Uh, his importance for my work and my thought has to do a great deal with the fact um, that I was um, I, I sort of raised within, oddly raised within, uh, a Wesleyan context. And, uh, and so I found myself confronted with Wesley's thought the whole time I was studying as uh, an undergraduate and then through, through two master's programs. The other figure, however, um, is Soren Kierkegaard, uh, someone who also had trouble deciding whether he was a philosopher or a theologian, uh, someone who decided not to decide as well. Uh, in fact, it is almost impossible to classify Kierkegaard, but Kierkegaard laid hold of me early on, and I think everything I've done from, about the t from my early 20s on has been some way of engaging with him and with Wesley. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for being here instantly. I, I don't know when the best time to say these kinds of things might be, but let's do it now. Thank you. Um, I find myself thinking about Willie Loman a great deal, um, <laughs> the main character in Death of a Salesman. I'm wondering if he would be happy with this event. I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe so. Uh, I also want to say this, uh, and I may say this again later, I'm not sure. But I've thought about the fact that Jack and Stan are a, are a part of this event. I mean, this is sort of swan song-ish for me, I suppose. Uh, and I, I really, I've sort of gone through uh, names of people that might have been invited to this. Friends and people I don't know particularly well, but I respect. And although it's, I mean, it, this is the sort of thing you'd expect me to say, I actually really mean it. I really mean it. I, this is really true, <laughs> okay? It's not going to sound true, but it is. There could not have been two people chosen to be with me in this event that would have made me happier than these two. Two persons that, um, that could have sort of fitted into this event as well as Stan and Jack do. Uh, that's in part because they are very, very different from each other, theologically and philosophically. Um, and, and I resonate profoundly with both of them and have, have um, gained more than I could ever say from their work. So this is, I mean, they're doing this very nice thing for me. If I knew what it meant to be honored, I would be very honored that they're a part of this. Um, but I'm just very, very grateful that they're, they're here. Um, I don't know if you're as grateful to be here as I am because uh, it allows us to uh, 
renew friendship and friendship has been such an important category for not only our relations with one another but for our thinking theologically and my own background um, I always say I became a theologian because I couldn't get saved I, wa I was part of one of those evangelical Methodist churches where you joined the church and were baptized on Sunday morning but you had to be saved on Sunday night and uh, I uh, uh, when I was around 15 or 16 I'd started to date and therefore I was a sinner and uh, <laughs> I thought I thought I wanted to be saved, but I didn't think you should fake it. So there I uh, sat Sunday night after Sunday night wanting to be saved, and it just didn't happen. So finally, one Sunday night, we were singing I Surrender All for the 23rd time for the <laughs> altar call. And I thought, if someone doesn't do something, this is going to go on all night. Uh, so I... Uh, so I walked up to the altar and gave Brother Zimmerman the right hand of fellowship saying I wanted to dedicate my life to God. I didn't have the slightest idea what that meant. But I started to, there was an associate pastor in the church who had actually gone to seminary and he told me I should read. So I started reading and I discovered that um, uh, I read a book by B. David Napier called From Faith to Faith. We weren't fundamentalists. We weren't that smart. But, um, I mean, you got to be smart to be a fundamentalist. And, but I, uh, uh, I thought the Bible was true, and, of course, I discovered that it wasn't, at least in what we thought was true. And then I read a book by Nels F. S. Ferre, who was a Swedish Londensian, called The Sun and the Umbrella, and it was a kind of, take on Plato's cave in which um, he said religion probably hid God as much as it revealed God and so I thought that's true so I gave it up but I didn't want to tell my parents because I knew it would hurt them uh, and we were working class I w my dad was a bricklayer I was trained to be a bricklayer and um, so uh, I w I'd gotten on the way to going to college but none of them no one in my family had ever gone to college. And I thought that if I was to be a Christian, I would be a liberal Christian. But I thought the Holocaust was the most decisive event against what it meant to be Christian. And I discovered that it wasn't the liberals who I thought I would become part of if I were a Christian that were part of the protest against Hitler, it was indeed Bonhoeffer and Barth. And the rest is history. I spent the rest of my life trying to work out what it means to be a Christian in the, in the face of the Holocaust, given the guidance of people like Barth and Bonhoeffer and Craig. The, um, the kind of work that he has done in terms of helping us see how the language does work for our formation as Christians in a world in which we have been far too accommodated toward is the kind of lessons that I've learned from him. And in particular, I mean, God help us to have a figure like Wesley in your history to take seriously. I mean, it's just so dispiriting to have a founder who had no sense of humor at all. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, Craig has helped that recovery in a way that um, uh, helps us see that Wesley being the, being the Whig that he was Nonetheless, God had possessed to make us recover aspects of the gospel that at once frighten but give us a way to go on. So it's wonderful to be here to be part of that discussion. This is wonderful. Um, 
that's just rich, just an introduction of getting to know you. Um, and you've been, Stan in particular, you've been so helpful because it's great to know that if we want to get people saved, all we have to do is just drone on and on in a sermon and it'll, it'll get, it get them to accept Jesus. Um, I'm going to just reread that first question um, just so we uh, know where we are. And by the way, because of the tighter format of this morning, the question and answer period is only going to be 15 minutes long. So as you're listening, if there's a particular question that you think you want to ask, I suggest you write it down and then that way we'll be able to make that possible when we get to that point. So let me just rephrase the question again. What philosophical, theological, and or historical factors influence the development of the early church's identity? Were there additional events that changed the church's identity, and if so, how? What lessons does the process of identity development for the early church teach us for the church today? Um, as as uh, you mentioned, my, my training is in philosophy, and my particular interest in philosophy is something called deconstruction, a word which... Uh, was foully used by a member of the Trump administration uh, a couple of weeks ago when he talked about deconstructing the administrative state. If he, in fact, knew what he was talking about, he would realize that's a very good thing to do, uh, but not in the way that he thinks. <laughs> because to deconstruct something is to go back and loosen it up. Now, my, my particular philosophical hero, but my hero is not John Wesley, but Jacques Derrida, <laughs> and who is the founder of this movement. And he at one, one time said, uh, the best way to deconstruct something is to just write a very detailed history of it, in, in which you discover that all the things you thought from the drop that dropped from the sky didn't drop from the sky. They got constructed in space and time by very fallible people. And uh, things weren't always the way they are now. So the, imp the importance for me of the early church is you get a good taste of that. You, get, you see the church in its nascent state. You see the church taking form, and it's, it is, for one thing, before the advent of, uh, for a moment anyway, before the advent of heresiology. The birth of theology is to the, occurs at the same time as the birth of heresiology, of tracking down the heretics and tracking down the dissidents and driving them off the, the reservation. Um, er, the early Christian writings, the letters of, of, Anti uh, of Ignatius of Antioch of origin, they're just filled full of stuff that would be driven off the reservation of the church right now, just full of uh, unorthodox ideas. Because the memory of Jesus is fresh, it's still relatively fresh, and uh, it's, uh, there are multiple voices, multiple views. There were multiple gospels that was lost or that were destroyed by orthodoxy. And it's a rich nation pre-institutional voice of the church. <coughs> and uh, there's a blossoming uh, negative theology in the, in the early church. So it's a very rich, uh, fertile, polyvocal world. But then I think two things happened which skewed it. And they're into the, 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 the first is philosophical, and that is it came under the spell of Neoplatonism. And that uh, made the body suspect. It eroded, the, the th one of the things that that, that Craig is always talking about is carnality, the, the, the carnal Jesus. And one of the things that happened was we lost the resurrection of what Tertullian actually said, not the resurrection of the body, but the resurrection of the flesh. Resurrectio car carnis, not corporis. And it became the immortality of the soul, an idea completely unheard of in the New Testament. And the dualism of, of Neoplatonism set in. And you, you can see it in Augustine's Confessions. You can see this, this concrete experience of life going on in St. Augustine in the Confessions. And you can see all this Neoplatonism 
all the dualism and, and the, the, the hunt for heretics. He wrote more books that began with the word contra than anybody in history. And the second thing that happened was uh, Constantinianism, when instead of the Roman Empire converting to the church, the church converted to the Roman Empire. And I think those two things have skewed the memory of Jesus profoundly. Uh, the term early church is actually kind of hard to define. Um, so let me just sort of talk about like the early couple of, the first couple of centuries of the history of the church. Um, I think it's very hard for a world that has such a large number of people that would check the Christian box on a survey to understand how statistically insignificant the church was for a long time. Uh, in the first century, the number of Christians was just tiny. I mean, there's no, there's no way a decent historian would have even mentioned it um, except, I mean, that would mention it now even, except for the fact that Christianity eventually became a big deal. Uh, I might also mention that since uh, Christianity, theology, church have all become pretty well delimited in the minds of people, uh, it's, it's difficult for us to recognize how ambiguous Christianity was, how ambiguous the church was early on. Uh, that shouldn't surprise us too much, however, if we think about this some, uh, because what Christianity, what the church leans into is Jesus, who himself is ambiguous. Now, let me, I need to say that in a certain way. I mean, he's ambiguous in the sense that historians don't know where to find him, but I don't care much about that issue. He's ambiguous in the sense that everything the church proclaimed about him concerns his relationship with others. And when he commands us, them, love your neighbor as yourself, he's indicating immediately that the line of separation between me and you is to be transgressed. Uh, what this indicates is that at the heart of the gospel, the question of identity is already being deconstructed. Uh, the notion of identity is the notion that something is the same. Uh, the word identity has a similar history to the a researcher's word ibid. Um, it means the same. Identity is all about the same. But what we find in the early stories concerning Jesus is that where, precisely where we want to protect ourselves, we want to distinguish between us and them, precisely where we want to set up walls and barriers to keep us safe, precisely there, God in Christ bursts through all of those boundaries. And I think this can be seen actually uh, sort of um, uh, emerging in the history of the church in the first few centuries. And, and in some ways it's hard for us to get there, that is it's hard for us to uh, locate this boundary transgressing dynamic in the church uh, because the tendency for academic types like us 
is to go first to the sort of big names, you know, the ancient dead, not always white actually, but we imagine them all as <laughs> white males. Uh, and to see what they taught. And I think there we do discover uh, an encroachment of a kind of otherworldliness that is not to be found, for example, in the New Testament. Uh, but if, if one looks at the sort of close to the ground movement of the church in the first few centuries, uh, one finds that earthiness is a huge, huge thing. So that, for example, uh, although there certainly were Platonists um, early on in the history of the church, it's not at all difficult to find them, for, for example, among apologists in the second century. Uh, but when Augustine began to very strongly push the notion that there is a clear distinction between the soul and the body, there were those, according to Justo Gonzalez, actually I'm trusting his research here, <laughs> there were those who accused him of the error of innovation. Now, innovation is not an error for us, but in, in the fifth century, it was thought widely to be an error. You don't bring in something new that has not been taught everywhere by the church. And what was thought to be new in Augustine, among other things, is that there is a clear distinction between the soul and the body. Now, of course, that position becomes very, very widely accepted very quickly, uh, largely because of the influence of Augustine, but others also, Greek-speaking theologians as well, who went in the direction of a soul-body dualism. But even then, throughout the Middle Ages, the body becomes a really big deal. And so Protestants are kind of embarrassed that, you know, that in the Middle Ages, relics were a big deal, you know. Um, but they were a big deal because bodies were still a big deal in the church, even if the official, you know, sort of dead white men uh, were maintaining something very different, or at least from appearances, maintaining something very different. Uh, so one more thing to try to make this point, and I'll, I'll let Stan go next, who has his own microphone, incidentally, which I think is not at all fair. <laughs> um, there is a phenomenon in the early church um, that needs careful consideration. It is the phenomenon of martyrdom. Um, now, we use the word martyr or martyrdom pretty freely these days. Normally, we use it for someone who's done something heroic, and by doing that, his or her life has been sacrificed. So we think of firefighters as martyrs and police as martyrs and soldiers as martyrs and others. Uh, but in the early church, martyrdom uh, became, uh, how can I say this? Um, martyrdom became a thing in the early church. Uh, it became cool, in fact, to be a martyr in the early church, which was a problem, actually. Uh, and so churchy folks got together, talked about the matter, and decided that they would lay down certain guidelines to what constitutes canonical martyrdom. Uh, and so there's a, there comes to be a very big difference between somebody, some Christian who gets killed and a Christian who happens to be a martyr. In other words, just getting killed by the authorities does not make you a martyr in the early church. It is the manner by which you bear witness with your life to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And that came to be understood in terms of life and death matters. In other words, the martyrs were those who died as a way of bearing witness to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But you were not a martyr if you pursued martyrdom as a goal. And there were lots of folks who did that, actually, because it was cool to be a martyr. They, they actually tried to provoke the powers so that they could go out in a blaze of glory. But the church said, 
No, don't do that. If you provoke your own martyrdom, you've made somebody a murderer. Martyrdom, if it comes, is a gift of God, not the result of works, lest anyone should boast. Martyrdom is a bearing witness with your life, and if bearing witness with your life to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ means that by and by they kill you, that's okay. That is a gift, in fact. Now, the, the, the complicated thing about martyrdom is that, on the one hand, it seems like life doesn't matter for the martyr because you can easily give it up if that is what is called for. But as it turns out, life is a huge thing. And giving it up is an event that occurs only in trust to the God who raised the crucified Jesus from the dead. In other words, martyrdom, instead of being a goal, becomes an eschatos. It becomes an end that is other than a goal. Martyrdom becomes an act by which you give everything away. You abandon all planning. You abandon all strategy. You abandon all of your future for the sake of the mercy and grace of God. It's not that life is unimportant that there are martyrs. It's that life is supremely important that there are martyrs. And so when the martyr Polycarp was asked by his interrogator why he was rushing to death, his interrogator trying to give him every possible reason for avoiding his fate, why are you rushing to death? His answer was, I'm not rushing to death, I'm rushing to life. And I believe that is to be understood in the most corporate, corporeal, bodily, fleshy way that we possibly can. John Yoder in Christian Attitudes Toward War, Peace, and Revolution, um, in response to those that worry that his account of early Christianity is far too radical, says there has been a people who lived and as a people across time made possible by a obedience to law that creates a holiness to worship of God that reflects the glory of God who lived without a land but nonetheless recognized one another across time and space who um, refused to use violence to secure their um, existence so there has been a people that have known how to live the way Jesus wanted us to live and made possible for us to live through cross and resurrection they're called Jews <laughs> I, um, uh, I, uh, I think that it is uh, one of the most extraordinary aspects and I worry about the word identity too because it's just too singular and invites that kind of reflection that one of the most ex extraordinary things I think about the Christians were their strong continuing identity with Judaism, I mean, you just cannot overlook the revolutionary presumption that the Christians, in response to Marcion, did not leave the Old Testament behind. 
I mean, and that, of course, that continues to create what McIntyre will call an epistemological crisis that we've been at for 2,000 years and haven't settled yet about how to read the Old Testament in relationship to the New. But what that does then, uh, that the Christians, that the gospel went to the Gentiles was an extraordinary, I mean, who could have anticipated that? And we still are not quite sure what to do with the fact that we're part of the promise that God, through Christ, made us part of the promise to, uh, to be the people of Israel. Those kinds of connections mean that argument is never over for us. It just is ongoing in terms of how we must be witnesses to what God has done in Christ. Now, that, interestingly enough, I mean, we want, because the gospel went to the Gentiles, give, gives us the presumption that what it means to be a Christian, anyone would want, if you just think hard enough and well enough, that we represent what anyone would think. And that kind of background is how we ended up wanting to rule the world through Caesar. And that that kind of development resulted in a church that was less than church. Prior, and this is Yoder's point, prior to Constantinianism, Christians had to have um, faith that God was present in the wider world because the wider world was beating the shit out of them. But they knew that God was present in the church because that made their lives co coherent. After Constantinianism, Christians knew that God was present in the world because the world was doing pretty well on their behalf, but now they had to have faith that God was present in the church because now they were less than Christian. <laughs> now, those kinds of political developments always are going to shape how theologically you have to go about the business of trying to think through <laughs> what it means to say that it is true that God raised Jesus from the dead. It is true. It happened. It's true because Christ is present now. It's not that we just have to work very hard at remembering him because otherwise he might be forgotten. You can't forget him because he's present now. Um, I, I think I'm going to pick up on something right at the end of, of what you just said, Stan. And it's the, the question of, of truth. Uh, For, for a number of years now, on the first day of uh, class, when I'm going over the stupid syllabus, like the worst class session ever, um, I come to a certain place, and this is almost always true, that a um, certain place in the syllabus where students are asked to turn in assignments that I have no way, I have no way of verifying what they're telling me. In other words, I just ask if they've read something or I ask if they've, you know, done certain other kinds of work. And, you know, if you write down, yes, I read it all or something, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and, and so I, I asked them not to lie to me. 
I just, I, that's all it is. I just say, please, please don't lie to me. And then I tell them this, tell actually many of you this. Um, I'm a theologian, more specifically a systematic theologian, more specifically a non-linear systematic theologian, which means that it is my task to speak of God a lot. And actually, I'm never able to shift into neutral. I'm always in systematic theologian mode. It's really kind of a sad thing about my life. I don't know how to do like small talk or something. <laughs> so like at parties, I just sort of sit around the corner and you know, flip through photo albums or something. <laughs> um, as a systematic theologian, I have to speak of God a lot. And as it turns out, I'm thinking of God almost all the time. That's also sad, isn't it? I mean, just really, it's, it's, I'm sure there's some psychological disorder that needs to be fixed in me. But I have found that the hardest thing of all is for a theologian or anyone else to speak of God without lying. Uh, that also is a terrible thing to believe, but I do believe it. Uh, and it, it's in fact the case that I've had to train myself not to judge somebody <laughs> who's speaking of God, whether from a pulpit or just you know, in a small group or some other situation. Someone speaks of God, my automatic reaction is, you're lying. Now, you know, I realize that's, you know, that's being really hard on people, <laughs> you know. That's really unfair. It may even seem really cynical or something. And, uh, and I don't mean to put someone down to sort of call into question someone's morality or something. <coughs> but that is my inclination. And, and I think that has turned my job into something especially difficult. I mean, most theologians, I don't think, ask this question very often at all. But my question, the question to me always is, what can I say that isn't a lie? Uh, and so I promise my students, and I don't know if this is a promise I've ever been able to keep very well. <coughs> but it's a promise, and I really mean it as a promise, that I will not lie to you. I will not lie to you. And so if, if someone were to challenge something I have to say, you know, I, I still have this sort of prideful, you know, reaction, you know, how dare you, uh, call my greatness into question. Don't you know I'm a, you know, I've been a, an academic all these years. What I say is, is right. You know, I, kind of, I, I have that kind of, everybody has, I assume everyone has that kind of reaction. It, I don't want to be humiliated, so I, I think first I need to defend myself. But this nagging concern about not wanting to lie always steps up. And it says, listen to them. Listen to them. It's not about whether you're right or wrong. It's whether you're lying or not. Are you lying now? And I think there's not a more important theological question. It's the question also of the martyr. When I step into the arena, when they light the fire beneath me, when they release the animals to tear me apart, am I bearing witness to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ or lying because it brings me glory, because it is a ticket to heaven? I mean, there are any number of ways that you could lie about martyrdom. Am I lying in my prayer? It is a prayer. I mean, the promise is a prayer that I won't lie. Do you, do you worry at all 
The, the word, you're one of the few people in the world that I would trust with the word martyr uh, nowadays, right? Because it is, uh, I, I guess, in, in, in the terms you just put it, it, it's a way a lot of people are lying to themselves uh, and the source of the worst violence in the, in the world right now, right? And it's precisely the will to become a martyr and the will to go to paradise that is the source of the worst violence. So from a strategic point of view, I never bring up martyrdom when I'm talking about this stuff. Does that worry you? What was the last question? Does that worry you? Using Does that worry me? Okay. Using a word yeah. that is uh, bomb flowers. Yeah, quite literally. literally. Um, I'm trying to decide whether or not to say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say a little bit of stand, then I want to hear it. Um, it makes it important for me to be as clear as possible about how I'm using the term. I, I still vividly remember, uh, I think I had only afternoon classes or evening classes or something that day. Uh, on September 11th when the airliners were flown into the World Trade Center. We had the television on for some reason and, and one of the two buildings was you know, emitting copious amounts of smoke and then we saw the second airliner fly into the second building. And this kind of thing is always talked about as a, as a kind of martyrdom, people giving their lives for the sake of the truth, people giving their lives for the sake of a cause, people giving their lives for the sake of God, people giving their lives for the sake of paradise, for the sake of heaven. So when I make the point, and I do make it often, I make it often, that the call of the gospel is a call to martyrdom, it is important that I distinguish this kind of martyrdom from what is in the news. Hmm. And to distinguish, among other things, the difference between a martyr and a hero. Hmm. Did you want to say something? Were you reaching? I, I do want to say something, but yeah. I want you to finish. All right, okay, all right. I didn't realize I saw you finish. Okay, no, that's, it's, it's always hard to tell. <laughs> um, ah, that's good enough, that's enough for now. Really, I'll say more. I, here's, here's my next question for you. Uh, here, did, I, I think that, and I think this is in keeping with what you're saying, you don't set out to be a martyr. You don't want to be a martyr. Ma Cannot. You don't will to be a martyr. If you're getting, going to get killed, it's against your will. That's right. But you're willing to take the risk. Uh, willing to live toward it. Willing, maybe. Well, Martin Luther King's assistants said to him, don't go to Memphis. Yeah. Stay home. Skip this one. Yeah. We've got reports. You stay put. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going up to Memphis. Right. Like Jesus right. went up to Jerusalem, right? You always go up to Jerusalem, you know, no matter where you are. You're, it's up. And you go up. He went up to Memphis. Now, if you don't want to say that was willing to go to Memphis, knowing the risk, I would say that's willing to know that, that you're not willing to get, you're, you're willing to expose yourself, right? Now, now on that account, on your account, that means Jesus was not interested in getting killed when he went up to Jerusalem. Now, how, does, how do you fit that together with the notion that Jesus' death was in obedience to the Father? If I might, yeah, please, please. Uh, I, I, exa Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus makes martyrs possible. I think Jesus was a martyr. No, because, <laughs> because Jesus, as the oh. Son of God, acted 
in obedience in a manner that um, is not. Jesus experienced a death that is more radical than any death that any of us experience because he, as the Son of God, went to a point where the Father could not reach the Son. And that's an extraordinarily frightening point that makes possible. See, one of the things, the martyr cannot know they are a martyr until we tell them they are. So there has to be a community formed by the death and resurrection of Christ that has the wisdom to know how to discern whose death is a witness made possible by the death and resurrection of Christ. So martyrdom is not a generalized category, but that is, as Craig quite rightly distinguishes just the death for a good cause, but martyrdom must be displayed Christologically in a way that is a test for the church to know that without this life, we wouldn't know well how to tell the story that makes us who we are. Can I just this. say just a little mm -hmm. response? I mean, that was, we're past time for the questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, the question as to whether Jesus is a, is a martyr, uh, I, I would be reluctant to say he's a martyr uh, only because of the fact that that makes the category martyr somehow more significant than Jesus himself. Yeah. So a martyr is one who bears witness to Jesus Christ. And inasmuch as Jesus Christ is to be understood, first of all, as the one crucified and raised, and how to say that without lying is a major challenge. Uh, since the martyr bears witness to Jesus Christ crucified and raised, um, the martyr gives his or her life to the work of Christ without the fear, no, no, I can't say it that way, because who's not going to be afraid of death, <laughs> gives him or herself to the work of Christ despite the fear of death, trusting that the same merciful God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is there for me too. Now, as the, the question of willingness, let me see if I can talk about that. Now, if, if we just use the word willingness um, casually, then I'm okay with that. But I don't see the work of a martyr to be, um, to be a work which emerges from the martyr's will. It is, I mean, the language of martyr literature is the language of gift. Of course, one is to live a faithful life, and if one's life is not faithful, then uh, one cannot speak of that kind of death as a martyr's death. But the event of martyrdom is a gift that comes, and for it, the martyr, where the martyr's still alive, <laughs> is in no position to boast. So Martin Luther King, I think, is a, I think he could illustrate this, I think, very, very well. And what he said in that last speech is, I want to do the will of God. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe want, you could say, I will to do the will of God or something. But what has priority here is the will of God. And therefore, he puts his life in a precarious position. And, of course, he lost his life in that position. In the case of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, his prayer is, don't 
make me die. Don't make me die, especially that way. You know, if it is possible, take this cup from me. The word cup here is it's a Eucharistic reference. The cup of his blood, his death. Take this death from me, this forsaken death from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. The soldiers arrive. He goes with them. So the martyr is the one, if I can put it this way, who imitates the crucifixion of Christ, trusting in the mercy of the resurrecting God. Boy, this has been so rich. Um, I had, I think... I love the way that it moved. Now, I'm the Pentecostal among us, so, uh, and we have clearly moved by the Spirit, as it were, in, the, in our format and the way we've gone, and I think it's been excellent. We're not really going to have, because there's another class in here, we're not really going to have the time to go over. And so what I can do um, is allow one question. And that's going to be all we'll be able to allow. And then is there somebody that has a, just like you're, you've got this like killer pressing question that you think, you know, it's going to answer the whole world. I'm, I'm a kidding. I'm, I didn't really mean it that way. <laughs> um, if you do raise your hand, if you have a question and then otherwise what I'm going to do, yes, I can't see who it is. Is that Dennis? Yeah. Yes, say it loud and then I'll repeat right. it. Well, let me lay this on all y'all. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's a, I mean, it, it makes God, God the Father into a child abuser. Right. He, he, he sacrifices one son for, the, for, for the, his other children. Jesus came into the world to, and he said, the reason he, he didn't say he came into the world to, to, to die and, uh, and redeem the rest of us. He said, I came into the world to anno announce the kingdom of God, good news for the poor, make the blind uh, to see, the hungry to get fed, and to announce the year of the Jubilee. That's why. And he kept saying that. And he said it at the wrong time, in the wrong place, and they took him out. So he got killed. I am. Um, um, I don't think Denny and Herbert are on the same page. No, no, right, right. And, uh, and I'm very sympathetic with Herbert's move. But um, what I worry a little about in terms that Jesus was killed because of the proclamation of the Jubilee year, which of course is in the politics of Jesus, the, one of the central arguments. But Jesus, I, I just am always thinking of that Jesus is dying for something other than maybe who he was. And we can never separate, therefore, the person and the work in a way that um, means that someone else could represent what Jesus was in a way that free we Christians from the theological claim that this was the second person of the Trinity. Okay, I think I have to say this quickly. Um, I have a very hard time talking about God's plans, mostly because I don't know how to do that without lying. You know, it's like I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I mean, after the fact, I can sort of speak in a certain prayerful manner about how God is glorified in something. That's also, I mean, it's prayerful. It's still not like a fact claim or something. So with the question about why did why was God incarnate in Jesus or something like that, the, the famous question of Anselm, why did God become human? Uh, I think it's important not to front load that 
as if the reasons are there beforehand. The reasons happen in the event. And when they happen, they are the reasons. And so, did Jesus come to be crucified, not as a plan, but as it turns out, that's how it must be, because that's how it was. For this reason, it seems to me that everything, I, this, whenever you say everything, you're going to overstate, but I just still think this is right. Everything about Jesus concerns the transgression of the difference between him and others, including the transition between, the, oh, please, no. My phone came on again. There's, uh, there's Siri telling me something. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and to transgress the boundary between human life and God. I mean, he is fully human, fully God, one person. That's the orthodox statement. So the transgression that occurs in the life of Jesus between him and others takes shape in commandments like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So the, all, everything about Jesus' work, there is that, there's that word again, but I think it's right. Everything about Jesus' work is opening up the boundaries between him and others, especially where others are being most violently crushed. And it is that transgression of boundaries that takes him to the cross. If there is no difference between him and his neighbor, and his neighbors are being crucified, then he gets crucified, not as a plan, but as the, let's, let's just call it the incarnation of God. Mm -hmm. anyway. there, real quick, there's a, there is a, Craig and I are not philosophers, but there is a philosophical point. Actuality precedes possibility yeah. mm -hmm. for us. As you can see, it's been very rich and it's going to continue. We encourage you to join us tonight the session begins at 6.30 in Upper Turner's campus on the uh, center on the East Campus. Uh, many of their books will be available for sale starting at 6 o'clock, so please do join us. And also as another reminder, if you didn't get enough and you would just love to continue this conversation, Terry Merrick has graciously opened her class, which is in Darling 411, and both uh, John Caputo and Craig will be joining her in an open discussion there. So you're welcome to continue it on into that. We'll see you this evening. Thank you so much.